Hello class, uh, today's lecture is going to be on chapter 8, gases. So we're going to focus strictly on gases in this chapter. We've talked previously about liquids and solids, so we spend a short chapter on gases. Uh, what we're going to discuss are the properties of a gas. Some of these we've already talked about in previous chapters. We're going to talk about how we measure the pressure of a gas and what are the units for the pressure and how to convert from one pressure unit to another. Uh, then we'll talk about the gas equations, um, specifically the ideal gas equation, which is the most important of the gas equations. And we'll do a number of problems uh, dealing with the ideal gas equation. And then we'll talk about the, the gas laws, uh, Charles Law, Boyle's Law, Avogadro's Law. These laws that were determined uh, from the early 1800s um, or even 1700s, 1800s. That's what developed the ideal gas law. And then the last section is on um, partial pressures, Dalt mixtures of gases. How much does each gas contribute to the overall pressure? Uh, this is especially important in the allied health fields where you do blood gases and things like that. So we've talked about uh, gases, the phases of matter before. We said that um, solids uh, have definite shape and definite volume. And you know the reason why that occurs is because of the strong intermolecular forces between the atoms. Um, it could be intramolecular like ionic bonding, like a crystal salt would keep its, would definitely be a solid inside the flask. Um, it, but it can also be strong dipole-dipole interaction or, or hydrogen bonding, uh, something of that nature. And molar mass also plays uh, a role in determining whether a, a substance will be a solid, liquid, or gas at room temperature. Uh, when we go to the liquid phase, what is happening is the force between the molecules, the intermolecular force, starts to weaken, and it allows the molecules to flow over one another and when that happens, we get um, uh, something that has a definite volume. This has a definite volume, but an indefinite shape. So it takes the shape of the container. But what we're going to focus on this chapter is gases. So gases, the shading here means that gases have motion to them. Um, that We can translate that into kinetic energy. Uh, kinetic energy is equal to one half um, times the mass times the volume and so um, volume square or velocity what am I thinking one half times the mass times the velocity squared so um, we assume in an ideal gas that this molecule is not not attracted to that molecule whatsoever and so they uh, gases move in a straight motion a straight line motion until they collide with something else so there there's no intermolecular forces between the gas molecules in the ideal gas and so because there is no intermolecular forces, that lends itself to being in the gas phase because there's no way for them to attract one another to stick together to be a liquid or a solid. So when we look at the periodic table, uh, all of these outlined in blue are um, on the periodic table are gases at room temperature. Uh, we have talked about, uh, in this class, Honcliffe Burr. These are the uh, elements that naturally occur as diatomic substances. Uh, and they're all, so that means that they're two atoms bonded together. And these are all gases except for iodine. Iodine is a solid at room temperature and bromine is a liquid at room temperature. But we would generally expect these to be gases because they're nonpolar molecules, so the only attraction of one molecule to the other is an instantaneous dipole, which we call a dispersion forces. Um, and you go, well, why are this? Why is this one a solid, and this one a uh, liquid? Well, as the molar mass increases, the likelihood of other phases being present are possible. So iodine, bromine, low on the periodic table down in this region, right? And so they're very heavy. And so even though they have dispersion forces, um, they're fairly strong dispersion forces and they have um, large molar masses.
All right, so I want you to understand the properties of a gas. These are really important. I want you to know these, memorize them, that gases are composed of molecules or atoms that are separate and they're relatively large by relatively large distances. What they're saying is if this is a gas molecule and this is a gas molecule, the amount of a, uh, volume separating these two gases uh, or distance between them is so great, we, all, we can assume that the gas, the volume of the gas is negligible, all right? So because the volume is so large between the gas molecules, that allows us to assume that these gas molecules are negligible compared to the amount of distance between them. So gases are compressible. You know they're compressible. You compress gas into a bicycle pump and it pumps up your bicycle tire. So we know they're compressible. Uh, they're in constant random motion. As long as a gas has a temperature, uh, temperature is how fast something's moving, it's going to have motion to it. They move in straight paths, straight line paths, until they collide with the wall or of the container or with one another. Uh, there's no energy lost when they collide. That's called an elastic collision. So they keep their energy. They retain their energy even after collision. And the more frequent the collisions, the higher the pressure. So the only way we know that there's a pressure is when these gas molecules are striking the container walls, we can tell that there's something inside the container. Or if we have a pressure gauge here, as the molecules strike or, uh, the diaphragm in the pressure gauge, we see a force registered on the pressure gauge. So the more co frequent collisions, either by decreasing the volume like this or increasing the temperature, uh, we're going to see an increase in pressure. So uh, we've kind of talked about slides like this one before. I want you to be able to see that um, as the temperature of a gas increases, then this, the, the average molecular speeds increase as well. So if we take like a defining point right here at 1,000 meters per second, you can see under the red curve, there would be more molecules of gas that have a kinetic energy of 1,000 meters per second or greater. Then, and there would be more of those than under the yellow curve, and then there's none under the green curve here. It's out in here. So what you see here is the average kinetic energy of a gas molecule sample is proportional to the absolute uh, temperature. So what they're saying here is temperature is proportional to the kinetic energy, all right? And then the other thing is that gas molecules have no intermolecular forces. They're neither attractive or repulsive. That's important in that the gases don't stick together or repel by each other. Now that again is assuming an ideal gas. And we are going to assume in this class that all gases we're talking about are ideal, that they behave with these four properties, uh, that they're not attracted, they move in straight lines, um, and so forth. So maybe you've seen this before. You can Google YouTube where somebody takes a 55 gallon drum and actually does this, but what they're doing here is they're removing all the gas from inside of the container and the atmospheric pressure uh, caused by the gas outside the container causes the container to buckle. So what causes the container to buckle is the atmospheric, the pressure outside the container uh, moves inward to this void that's in here because you remove the gas and it causes it to buckle. So I just the, you say, why is this important? It shows that we are under pressure at all times, that our bodies, all the molecules of gas on the earth are, you know, they're around us, they're above us, and they're being pulled towards the center of the earth by a gravitational force because they do have mass, and that creates a pressure on us. And we, we don't notice it much unless we're going up a mountain or down into a valley and our ears pop, or maybe when you dive into the, the water, and, uh, you know, it's not just the atmospheric pressure, it's also the water pressure forcing your ears to get tight. Um, but we are under a constant state of pressure, and then we call that atmospheric pressure. 
and this demonstrates that. So what is pressure? Pressure is equal to a force uh, divided by an area. I want you to know this equation. Uh, I want you to know that pressure, forces are generally measured in newtons and areas are in uh, meters squared. So generally you're gonna get something like newton per meter squared for a pressure. Um, you know, when you're driving on a car uh, and you run over a nail, it's not that the pressure didn't ch the uh, it's not that the uh, force didn't change the force was the same before it hit the nail and after the nail but because the area of that nail is so much smaller than the ground um, that the tire touches it punctures the tire and you get a flat so you can increase pressure by um, decreasing the area that would increase the pressure or you could increase the pressure by increasing the force but many times that's what's going to happen is we're going to decrease the area and that will cause the pressure to rise. The force didn't change, it's just that the area changed and which changed the pressure. All right, so the units for pressure, the ones I want you to know for sure are uh, 101,325 pascals equals one atmosphere. That's st so the standard pressure uh, is in measured in atmospheres and we say that the pressure on our bodies is one atmosphere or 101,325 Pascal uh, which is equivalent to 760 millimeters of mercury so that's saying that a column of mercury if you had a tube of mercury uh, from the surface of the mercury here to the where it makes a meniscus in the top of the glass tube here that distance would be 760 millimeters all right 760 millimeters also called 760 tor in honor of torricelli who invented the barometer which we're going to see on the next page bars somewhat important if you're thinking about being a meteorologist and you see like a, a low on the weather uh, you know they're showing us the weather and they're showing us the map and you see these little black lines like this around a low that means every, that's a, called a pressure gradient, that each one of these represent a certain isobar of pressure. And the closer these are, the more the change is occurring between here and here. And that means you're gonna have a windy day. So if you see these isobars, these lines on a weather map, and they're really close together, that means it's going to be very windy. You see that, especially with hurricanes, you'll see that low from the center of the hurricane. And then you'll see these really tightly um, drawn lines around the low, which shows the wind. There's going to be, it's going to be wind. Um, you might want to know this one. That there's 14.7 PSI uh, in an atmosphere. So, um, you know, when they say you need to inflate your tires to um, 32 PSI, that's, you know, um, close to two, a little more than two atmospheres of pressure inside your car tire. Or you're going to inflate a basketball. Most of the time, you inflate a basketball about about the same 14. You want you definitely want your basketball to have at least the same pressure as outside, because if it's less than, it's going to feel flat, and if it's more than, it's going to have a little bit more bounce to it, right? All right. So this is the type of problem you're going to see. I'll I'll show you what I expect here. Uh, I expect you to read the problem and. Uh, that you would go, okay, what's the relationship between millimeters of mercury and atmospheres? And you'd go, well, I've memorized that 760 millimeters of mercury is equal to uh, one atmosphere. And so if I've got 695 millimeters of mercury, then I need to convert millimeters of mercury to atmospheres. So that means I need to divide both sides of my quality up here by 760 millimeters of mercury. This side becomes one. That tells me it's a true conversion factor, and I'll put that in here. I know I've set this up right because the millimeters of mercury cancel out. I'm left with units of atmospheres, and that's how I know to solve the problem. So this is the same way we've been solving mathematical problems from you know, chapter two or three. Um, 
nothing different here. If you've got that down from chapter three, you should be in good shape for the type of conversions we're going to be doing. So I'll just skip to the next slide and show you what that looks like. So same thing here, you would have to know that one atmosphere of pressure is equal to 14.7 pounds per square inch. And so we want the atmospheres to divide out. So we divide both sides by one atmosphere. That becomes one. I take this conversion factor, plug it into here, and I find out 3.45 atmospheres is equal to 50.7 PSI. Not hard, one step conversion problem. That's the way you want to think of it, one step conversion problem. All right, next problem, or the next thing is, how do we measure pressure? Well, atmospheric pressure is measured by an instrument called a barometer. You need to know that. A barometer, in its simplest form, is a pool of mercury. We take a glass tube, we fill it completely full of mercury. So here's a glass tube that's closed off. Fill it completely full of mercury. Put our finger over it, which we wouldn't do that today, but that's what Torricelli did. Flip it over and take your finger off. And what he found out was some of the mercury flowed downward, but it stopped. So he realized there was a pressure pushing on this surface of mercury that was keeping the mercury up the tube to this point. And so up here, this is a vacuum. There's nothing in here because the mercury flowed down and there's just so keep that in mind the mercury is freely allowed to move up and down this glass tube and the reason why it doesn't move down any further is because of the atmospheric pressure pushing on the pool of mercury he measured the distance from the pool of the mercury to the top of the meniscus which what i'm talking about that is mercury forms a convex meniscus a bow like this in the top you measure from the top of the meniscus to the surface of the mercury and he came up that it, when he measured that it was 76 centimeters or what we've seen recently is 760 millimeters which means the same thing of mercury all right so a barometer again measures atmospheric pressure it's the pressure of the atmosphere pushing on the surface of the mercury and the equation that relates this is um the pressure is equal to the height of the mercury, 76 centimeters, times the density of the mercury, times the gravitational pull. And the gravitational pull of any mass is 9.8 meters per second, all right? Or meters per second squared, if you want to think of acceleration. So either way. So that's what we're looking at there. So another type of pressure instrument is called a manometer. So a manometer is different. It's not exposed uh, directly to the atmosphere and it's used to measure, uh, well, at least one of them's not. Uh, this one's actually exposed to the atmosphere here, but we'll talk about that. So here you have a gas. You'd like to know what the pressure of uh, this gas is inside this container. So the gas escapes the tube, it pushes down on the mercury and it forces the mercury up the tube. And depending on what this pressure is, it's gonna determine what the height of the mercury is gonna be. Like if this pressure increases, it's gonna force this mercury down the tube. It's gonna force this mercury up the tube and you'll get a larger height there. So um, again, you can see that pressure equals height of the mercury there it is, times the density of the mercury, which should be given, times the gravitational pull on the mercury. So whatever the pressure, uh, what, when we calculate the, pre the pressure of the mercury here by this equation, then we know what the pressure of the gas is inside the container. All right, so uh, this one is called a closed manometer because up here the tube is sealed off, the glass tube is sealed off, and you have a vacuum up here, just like you had with uh, Torricelli's uh, barometer. But again, what's the difference between a barometer and this? Here, the gas in the container is pushing on the mercury, not the atmospheric pressure. So you say, well, 
what happens if you add if the pressure of the gas is so much it forces the mercury to the top up here? Well, eventually it can pop the top off and you've got a big mess. So if you're thinking you're dealing with pressures greater than one atmosphere, uh, then you probably want to use this type of barometer, a manometer. This manometer is called an open manometer. It's called an open manometer because this isn't sealed off. So you have the atmospheric pressure pushing down on the surface of the mercury here. And then you also have this, the height of the mercury. So the pressure of this gas is measured by the pressure of the mercury, which is this equation here, times the atmospheric pressure, which was measured at the time that you were taking this measurement. All right. So a manometer, uh, it's not measuring directly the pressure of the atmosphere. It's measuring the pressure of the gas in the container. In this case, the pressure of the gas in the container is equal to the pressure of the, caused by the mercury plus the atmospheric pressure. That's an open manometer. All right. So other, if you're not measuring atmospheric pressure, uh, which is measured with a barometer, you're measuring a closed container of gas, you use a manometer. All right, the equation that we're going to use is the ideal gas equation, PV equals nRT. So P stands for pressure, units is in atmospheres or should be converted to atmospheres. Volume is in liters. Uh, N is the number of moles of gas that you have. You're going to memorize the ideal gas constant, R here. Memorize this constant, 0.0821. Units is liter atmospheres in the numerator. Kelvin moles in the denominator. And then the temperature, this is what's probably most missed. You might measure the temperature in degrees Celsius, but it has to be converted to Kelvin before you solve the problem. And you can tell that's the case because the units right here are Kelvin, not degrees Celsius. This is called the ideal gas equation, PV equals nRT, and you do have to memorize it. It relates pressure, volume, number of moles, and temperature. All right, so let's look at um, let's look at a problem you're going to have. So I'm going to show you how to solve any problem really we have from here on out in the chemistry course. We're getting towards the end. You're going to start seeing things combining from previous chapters to this chapter and the next chapter. And by this point, you should start being able be a little comfortable in taking a reading problem and solving for the correct answer. So what you do is you write down what's given. So it says calculate the volume. So you're gonna say volume question mark of an ideal gas at room temperature. And they tell you that room temperature is 25 degrees Celsius. Uh, they tell you that the uh, pressure is equal to one atmosphere. And they tell you that you have one mole of gas. And notice that's spelled out, so that means an infinite number of significant figures. So the first thing you ought to be thinking is, um, when I see VT and P and N, I should say, oh, the equation I need is the ideal gas equation, PV equals nRT. And then um, I need to solve for V, because that's what they're asking us to, to determine. So I need to divide both sides of the equation by P to keep the equality in force. And I'm going to get V equals nRT over P. So then um, I start plugging in my what I know. I know I have one mole. I know R is 0.0821 liter atmospheres mole Kelvin. And then the temperature I've got a problem. This is in degrees Celsius and I need it to be in Kelvin. So I add 273. And if you want more significant figures, you can say 0.15 because that's what we did. It's like the temperature conversion, right? That we did previous chapter. So that's going to be 298.15 Kelvin. And then I'm going to divide that all by the pressure, which is one atmosphere. All right, so the atmospheres cancel out, um, the Kelvin cancel out, the moles cancel out. I'm left with liters, which is the unit for volume, and I know I've set the problem up correctly. 
That's what you have to do. That is the steps right there. Read the problem, extract the information. That should clue you in as to what equation you need. Manipulate the equation to solve what it's asking for. Then plug in your values. Make sure the units cancel out correctly and that you get the unit you're solving for. This is what it looks like cleaned up. It's the same thing. And the answer is 24.5. It has three significant figures. Why? Because this has an infinite number. This has three. This has three. And the one atmosphere is 1.00 atmospheres. So you should have three in your final answer there. It's funny they didn't write that. They showed up here correctly. But here they just have one. They should have said 1.00 there. All right. So let's look at another problem. Same thing. They want they do quite a few examples here because they want you to get the pattern, which is here you have um, n equals 1.44 moles, and you have uh, a volume equal to 5.00 liters, and you have a temperature equal to 36 degrees Celsius. We might as well just add 298.15 or 290. Oops, what am I doing here? 273.15 to that. And that's going to equal 309.15 Kelvin. And then they're asking us to calculate the pressure. So that's our question mark. So again, P N V T. Oh yeah, this is ideal gas equation. PV equals NRT. And um Let's see, we're solving for pressure. So pressure equals NRT over V. All right. And so I'll just, I'm not going to fill this one completely out. Let's just go back to, go to this one. And so there you see it. There's my N. There's my R. There's my T converted to Kelvin. And there's my volume in liters. Notice in this one, they do keep the volume, all three significant figures. Moles cancel out, Kelvin cancels out, liter cancels out. The only thing left is atmospheres, and that's what we're solving for is pressure. So we know we set this problem up correctly. All right, so that's the process. That's the process right there. Let's do another one. You know, plenty of practice on these. All right, next one, determine the number of moles. So N is our question mark. Um, tells us that the um, volume occupied is 12.3 liters. They tell us that the temperature, now they're being nice to you, 298 Kelvin, and they tell you the pressure is equal to 1.80 atmospheres. All right, so again, start with the equation that you know. Don't try to do this in your head. Write the equation that you know, and then go, oh, I got to solve for this. So I need to divide both sides by RT. And I'm going to get N equals PV over RT. All right. So we get PV equals over RT. This side, this cancels out, that cancels out. We get N. And I've just flipped it to make it easier. All right. So then it, after you get that part, you've, you've got the hard part done. So next slide shows that this is what it looks like which we solved for PV over RT. Again, just watch the units cancel out. Now here's where I do see some students have some problem. This liter cancels out with this liter. This atmosphere cancels out with this. This Kelvin cancels out with this. The mole is in the quotient of a quotient. And that's the same thing as being in the numerator. So this is no different than if you have a pie and you cut it in half, you know, how many halves do you have? You can easily see it's two, but mathematically what you're doing is you got one whole pie, you've cut it in two halves, you cut it in half, and how many halves do you have is two. So this two is in the quotient of a quotient, and so therefore that's why you get an answer of two there. <coughs> All right. So that one's not too bad. I think the big thing here is just seeing maybe for the first time something in the quotient of a quotient. All right, next problem. Here they're saying at what temperature? So you're saying temperature is question mark. You're saying I've got 2.71 moles. 
and you have um, a volume of equal to 30.0 liters <coughs> and you have uh, standard pressure now here they're being a little what is standard pressure well you need to know that standard pressure is one atmosphere all right 1.00 atmospheres just like standard temperature you need to know that one too standard temperature is 0 degrees Celsius or 273.15 Kelvin again the equation when you look at those variables uh, ideal gas equation is what ought to pop up here we're solving for temperature so temperature equals PV divided by NR right so I divided both sides of the you know the right hand side of the equation by NR to get uh, T by itself flip it around to solve for the T you know just to make it easier for us so it looks T is PV over, over NR and again everything cancels out atmospheres cancel out liters cancel out moles cancel out Kelvin is in the quotient of a quotient, same thing as being in the numerator. Everything has three significant figures. You should have three in your final answer, 135 Kelvin. All right, next thing we're talking about here is the combined gas law. So it's like we take a uh, gas under certain conditions and we change one of the variables and we now want to know what the other condition is like I mean really what this comes down to is there's six variables here right one two three four five six you have to know five of the six and you're going to solve for the sixth one all right five of the six and you're going to solve for the sixth one now why is this equation so important a lot of everyday life events work off the combined gas law and not just the ideal gas law and we're going to see an example here in a minute and the second thing is it it shows you that it it's maybe looks like an ideal gas law problem or ideal gas equation problem but when you start seeing multiple variables of the same thing like two temperatures or two volumes that's the flag to say hey this isn't just an ideal gas equation this is a combined gas equation all right, so let's look at an example here. Here's a classic example. So uh, a child releases a balloon that's 6.25 liters. So what we would do here is we'd say, all right, volume, we'll just say one, is equal to 6.25 liters. And they tell us that from the parking lot of amusement park where the temperature, temperature one, is 28 degrees Celsius. Uh, we might as well just go and convert that to Kelvin. So 273.15 added to that is equal to uh, what, 301, all right, 0.15 Kelvin. And the pressure is equal to 757.2 millimeters of mercury. So if we just did that, you might be thinking, oh, this is an ideal gas equation. The only thing I don't know is what N is, but the thing is, if we're talking about a balloon, N's already sealed off. N is, is a constant, all right? But then the problem says, what will the volume be, question mark, when the balloon has risen to an altitude where the temperature new temperature t2 is equal to negative 34 degrees celsius so we have to add 273 to that 0.15 and that the final pressure is equal to 366.4 millimeters of mercury so with all of those variables you go well this is an ideal gas equation i've got two different temperatures, two different pressures. I'm asked to find the new volume. I've got the initial volume. So that's the flag. I think when you write this down, you're gonna go, oh, this is a combined gas law problem.
and then I think you're going to go, oh, I need to solve for V2. So I'll multiply both sides by T2 over P2. T2 over P2. That cancels out that T2. That cancels out that P2. I got volume 2 by itself on one side of the equation. And so if we go to the next slide, you'll see it all cleaned up professionally. But you have to do that. So there it is. You can see there's P1 times V1 over T1, and then there's T2, and then P2 in the denominator. So now you've got all your data organized. You plug it into the equation. You don't have to change the millimeters of mercury. The Kelvin has to be changed, though. Some people say, well, they're going to cancel out. Can I just leave it in degrees Celsius? No, you cannot. It has to be in Kelvin for a gas. And then you can see the only unit that's not canceled is liters, which is a volume unit. So our final answer comes out to be 10.3 liters. So the balloon goes from 6.25 liters to 10.3 liters. A lot of times the balloon's going to pop, right? When a helium balloon goes way up in the air, eventually expands so much it pops. So just keep that in mind. Good equation, good problem. Normal, you know. Uh, if you're working with Dr. Noel or Professor Knowles on um, her environmental group, um, they are releasing weather balloons to study uh, solar eclipses. And I, I believe the eclipse coming up in the spring, they're actually taking a group to launch, help launch weather balloons at given intervals to capture um, the eclipse. Let's say it's clouded over at the ground level it'll capture it uh, above the cloud. So really neat stuff. Maybe some of you are involved in that. If not, um, you can contact Professor Knowles and see if you, uh, you know, how to, how to participate in it. Sounds like an interesting project. All right, let's look at uh, the next problem. All right. I'm going to stop here. I'm going to break this lecture down into at least two parts. So we'll pick up here on the next uh, on the next lecture.